Well, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah in, in chapter 43, God talks about wanting to do a new thing for his people. So I wanted to bring us to that uh, attention to that, this passage to talk about what our prayer is for something new in our lives. What our prayer is for something new. You know, we're talking about this theme uh, this whole month of August, pray first. And I want to give us some tangible prayers that maybe God is calling us to pray in our lives. So before we read Isaiah chapter 43, starting in verse 16, um, I encourage you to get there I, um, if you uh, haven't already, but Isaiah chapter 43, verse 16, there's a little bit of background to what's happening. God's people are in captivity, but it's the result of their own sin and rebellion. See, God allowed them to get in trouble after they rebelled against the Lord to show them that they are in need of a God for rescue. And what happens is they call out to God and God does rescue. And here the people are, they're in captivity because of their own doing, yet God gives them a promise. He gives them a promise and fills them with hope that they will be rescued, that they will be restored. And so hold on because that day is coming. Now, this message encourages them. It's filled with hope, but it's also filled with warnings. It's also filled with warnings. Guys, you need to follow me. I have something for you, but you need to stay consistently following me to receive what it is that I have down the road for you. And it's also filled with hope. I'm here. I'll never leave you. I will restore you. I will rescue you every time you call to me. Now, that's the story of the Israelites, but doesn't that sound a little bit like our story too? I mean, it's almost like nothing's changed. You know, we, when we need him, he's there. He hasn't left us. And he does have an awesome promise, a life for us. When we pursue him, we find what that's like. And so here they are in captivity, and God gives this, this, this message. He speaks to them, and this is what he says in Isaiah 43, verse 16. He says, this is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses, the army and reinforced reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again. In other words, they died. Extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. What's he talking about? Does anybody know, just go ahead and blurt it out, what event is the parting of the Red Sea? Of the Red sea. That's right. Now, the, the thing that's re re remarkable about the parting of the Red Sea is that God split the sea, opened it up, they were the, the Israelite people, just to refresh your mind on this story, they were up against the sea and there was an army coming after them, one of the most powerful armies, Pharaoh's army out of Egypt. Just the chariots just racing towards them. They were like, whoa, we let all our slaves go. That wasn't a good idea. And so Pharaoh's like, go get them. So they're on their way to go get them. And they're like, where are we gonna go? The sea is behind us. The army's up before us. And God says, uh, Moses, I want you to stretch out your rod. He does. And what does God do? He literally splits the water. And the whole Israelite nation walks across dry ground to the other side. Not only do they get out of that crazy, hairy situation, but guess who's following behind them? Well, it's the army. And the army, they're on chariots, you know, they're on their way. And they're like, we're going to get them. Let's go. And they get, ha they get all the way in on this dry ground. The Israelites get to the other side. And you know what God does? He closes up the ocean. Now, it's a bad place to be when God closes up the ocean because you're going to be... Help me, please. I'm drowning. Right? You're going to... It's not good. <laughs> and God is reminding them that Pharaoh's army is underwater and they're safe on the other side. But not only that, every single one of them was extinguished, never to rise again. They were snuffed out like a wick. So God is reminding them, this is the God speaking to you right now. The God who did that amazing thing back there. That's me. I am an amazing, awesome, powerful God that has brought you out of slavery. I've redeemed you. I've restored you. I've guided you. And then verse 18, God says this. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. Wait a minute. You just reminded us of what you did. And now you're telling us to forget back then, to not dwell on what you did back then. Verse 19, 
God clears it up. He says, see, I am doing a new thing. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Don't you perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Now see, God was telling his people, the God who's speaking to you right now is the God who did that awesome thing back there. Remember that? Yeah, well, forget it that right now. Forget that right now because that's the God who is going to now do a new thing in you. I am going to, I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. You don't think there's a way here? Oh, there's a way. There's deliverance to come, and I'm going to do that for you. He is going to make streams in a wasteland. You don't think there's anything going on here? I'm going to bring a stream. It's not just going to be a little, it's going to be a stream. It could turn into a river because that's the work that I do for my people. I am doing this. It's a new thing. Now, Jesus, or God wasn't just telling them about this rescue that was coming and how he's going to lead them again. He was also pointing towards Jesus, the Messiah. The new thing that God was going to do is redeem all people through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection proved that he is the way. And so Isaiah, through the, through the prophet Isaiah, God is pointing not just at the redemption going to happen, but what's going to happen through Jesus. And you know what's so cool about that? Is that new thing he's talking about, it lives out in your life and mine because Jesus still saves today. Can I get an amen for that? I mean, that's good stuff. I have done a great thing, but I want to do a new thing, God is telling his people. I'm preparing you for redemption, for rescue. God still wants to do that new thing in the life of his people, you and me, even today. Um, I came across an interesting research. These two guys, these two researchers, their last names are interesting, uh, Bunzek and Duzel are their names. Um, anyway, um, I don't think they're from Grants Pass. That's what I've, I'm kind of figuring. But um, smart dudes. And what they did is they ran a really interesting experiment. And what they did is they tested people's brain activity. So they put people's um, head in this MRI machine. I'm not sure how this all works out. Um, but in either case, they did that. And then they, they had these flashcards with like pictures on them. So some of the pictures were familiar things like Maybe it's members of their family, maybe their dog, maybe their house, um, you know, uh, their table, a spoon, a, a picture of uh, the neighborhood, a picture of, you know, things that they were familiar with. Then there were pictures in the flashcards of things that they weren't very familiar with, things that didn't happen often in their life or come across often. And then there were pictures of brand new things in, that they had never seen around them before, or that, were, that, that they, were, they would have been brand new for them. Now, what they were hoping to find out in scanning the brain is that they would find that brain activity would, be, would spike about the same with somewhat new information and brand new information. And that, that those two categories would be drastically different than the very familiar. But what they actually found was this, when they were scanning those people's brains and doing the flashcards, is that only completely new things cause strong activity in the midbrain area. Only brand new items, brand new information. All of a sudden, they would see a spike in brain activity. And they would continue this on, and they found that, in fact, dopamine was released greater levels in the brain with new information. And they equated this to learning. In fact, if, it's a great little article, because they were like, if you want to learn how to study more, then when you're studying things that you already know, throw in some new stuff, because your brain will go, whoa, new stuff. And then it'll remember stuff around the new stuff more than just if you just keep studying the same old, same old, same old, same old. It was just kind of, so they were kind of going educational route on that. But what we find out is, it seems though that God has wired you and I, our brains, to neurologically respond to new things. That's the way he's wired us. Now, by the way, it's very possible that the marketing departments of companies have caught onto this. If you have a brand new phone, they got you. They know that we're wired to like new things. Oh, it's the new update. Oh, it's the new iPhone. Oh, it's the new, it's the new, it's the new. I gotta have it, I gotta have it. And we go get it. Because God has wired us neurologically to enjoy something new, to want to gravitate, to be attracted to something new in our lives. And so the marketing teams are like, oh, thank you, God, for this one. We're gonna be selling out of this product. And when that one sells out, we'll just add something new and call it the new product. And then we'll put that out there and they'll buy it again. By the way, they've caught on to that, just a heads up. 
God has created us and wired us. He's the one that's done that. And everything he does has purpose. It was not so that companies can get richer, by the way. But we are attracted to new things. We get excited about new things. And what does God want to do? He wants to do a new thing in his people. He wants to new, do a new thing in us and around us. And we are wired then to move towards those things that God wants to do. And so if God's saying, I want to do a new thing, we should go, what? Really? A new thing? God, you want to do a new thing? And that's what I want us to do this morning is I want us to lean in to the fact that God wants to do a new thing. Now, all throughout the Bible, God points to something new. I want to, I want to show this to you. I'm going to throw out some verses, but I need your participation. I have a little sign here that says, okay, I'm going to need your participation. I have a little sign that says, new. Good, thank you. So I'm going to go through these verses, and when I get to the word that says new, I'm going to hold this up, and you're going to say, new. oh, you guys are so good. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So here we go. God told his people long ago at Ezekiel 36, 26, and I will give you a new, new heart and a new. new spirit, and I will put it within you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul reminds us, if any was in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Ephesians 4, 22-24, Paul tells us this, to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life that is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new, new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. We are created a new. in Christ Jesus. So that we are created new. in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. God wants to do a new, new thing in us. He has he desires that we are renewed in our minds through his word and his spirit, that we are created new in the new identity of Jesus Christ, that we are being transformed into a new creation. When we say yes to Jesus, we say yes to new things that are happening. Can someone help me with this one a little bit? Can someone give a testimony like an amen, praise the Lord, right on, that works for me. When you say yes to Jesus, God is doing a new thing in you. In fact, when you give Jesus lordship of your life, when you say, Lord, I surrender all, Lord, I'm serious, like I want all of me to serve all of you, God is doing a new thing in you. Lord. It happens. That's what God desires. He wants this new creation to continue to be transformed by the renewing of our minds but through the Lord, and it's just awesome. But here's the challenge. There are times and seasons there are moments in our lives, there are activities and habits and behaviors and attitudes that get in our way of these new things that God wants to do in us. There are times and seasons and moments, there are activities and habits and behaviors and attitudes that get in our way from experiencing the new thing that God desires to do in us and through us and around us. And so we need God to say, we need, we need to pray. We need to God, ask God, Lord, would you reorient my heart and my mind so that I'm moving towards you? And that's why we want to encourage you simply with these bracelets. Just pray first, Lord, do a work in me. Today, do something new today in me. May I look towards you. May I press in towards you. And so really what we're going to talk about for the next couple of weeks is, Lord, reorient my heart and my mind. Help me to move away those barriers that keep me from the new things that you're wanting to do in my life. That's what this, these prayers are about. Now, one of those things that, that gets in the way is a word called nostalgia. You know what nostalgia is? Nostalgia is basically, it's, a, it's an emotion attached to a past memory, if I could just break it down like that. It's a strong, positive emotion that is attached to a past memory. It's when we say, you remember the good old days? You know, we say that, right? You remember the good old days? In fact, earlier this week, um, I was messing with Google Earth on my phone, the app. If you guys ever mess with Google Earth, it's so fun. You can do it on a computer too, but you could just zoom in on different parts of the world and just check things out. Anytime I'm going to go to a new lake or a stream and someone's telling me about a fishing hole, 
I, I take a picture of Google Earth and I go, circle which spot you're talking about because that's where I want to go. And so anyway, I, we were kind of looking at it and I was like, I'm going to look up my old address in California. And so I typed it in and, and then it kind of zooms in on where that house was that we used to live. And I was like, oh, I used to live there. We spent 15 years in that house and it brought flooded back all these memories. You know, and like, oh man, remember when, when uh, we would have these front yard barbecues with the neighbors and we would have these block parties and, and we just played kickball. Remember when you, you know, I thought, remember the kids were playing kickball and the ball went over to my car and broke the spoiler off the back of the car. I remember that uh, very, very vividly. Um, but I remember the good times too. And I remember the, the, I was looking at, we had an alley in the back and then I was like, oh yeah, I remember the trash can I caught on fire. That wasn't a good day either. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't good. Um, and the fence. Who said and the fence? That was my wife. Thank you. I was just going to leave it at trash can and leave it alone. But if you want to hear that story, um, I don't want to share it because it's kind of embarrassing. But anyway, so I remembered all that. And I just, it brought back this like, oh, I remember the good old days when the kids were like, you know, just little and running around. And wow. You know what the problem with nostalgia is we start to think about the good old days and then we start to compare today with the good old days. You know, I wish things were like they used to be. And nostalgia can really be a problem because it, not, it paints a good picture, but it sometimes paints over some of the ugly parts. And we just have this memory that's like, oh, this was good, but there were problems then too. But we just think, oh, well, that was just, we bring out all the good and we go, if we could just be like that again. And nostalgia can get in our way of new things. In fact, nostalgia was a problem for the Israelites. If you unwrap their story, they're heading through the desert and they're starting to complain to Moses. They're actually whining. <laughs> Why are we here? I want some, and, you know, Moses, you want some cheese with that wine? <laughs> you know. In fact, one of the things that they were whining about was you know, why can't we just go back to Egypt? Nostalgia. Where we were slaves. We would rather go back to then than die in the desert like this. Um, hello, you're on the way to the promised land where it's going to be your land. It's going to be flowing with all this stuff and you want to be slaves again? You see, nostalgia can almost blind us from the thing that God wants to do because we're too held captive from our our past and the good old days. And see, the Lord knew this. That's why he said, he who made the way through the sea, he who split the waters and then drowned that army, forget the former things. Don't dwell in the past. The Lord knew that if you dwell on those past days, that you're somehow going to think that the past days are going to be better than the days I have for you. And so we can get stuck back there. And so I want us to learn four prayers as we pray first this month. Four prayers that are going to prepare our hearts and our minds for the new things that God wants to do. Now, these four prayers were given to us by our district, at District Assembly by our District Superintendent, Brett, Ricky, and I, I think it's applicable for us to look at these prayers. The first prayer is this. Oh, Lord, help me to let go of your former graces. Help me to let go of your former graces. See, our issue is we fail to forget and we focus on the familiar. We like to get comfortable with the way things have been going, even if they're not working. Don't we? No, we have to do that because we've always done that. Is it working? I don't know. It's just the way we've always done it. Because why? We like nostalgia. And it can get in our way. And our prayer needs to be, Lord, help me let go of those former graces. Help me not to be so comfortable with things that things were. Lord, I want to see great results. And, and the, the past is not going to flood my life with the results you have. That's the past. But we hope it does, right? We just, if we could just think about it some more, maybe somehow those things will just come back and just be in our lives again today. And we compare the present moments and how good the past was. And we hope that it will move us forward. But it doesn't. You know, we can do this in a lot of ways. We can do this for a house. We can do this in a relationship and family and business and even in the church. Remember when, that's a great way to start the, that, that, down that road. Remember when we used to? Remember when we had this? Remember when we would do this? 
do you remember before the pandemic when we were, and then everybody gets all upset, you know? We cannot st- st- keep th- saying, I, let me say that, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, let me say that again. We, <laughs> we gotta stop saying remember when because the, that's in the past. The Lord wants to do a new thing in your life and in our church, in our neighborhood, in our city, and he needs us to be attentive to those new things he wants to do. You know, maybe there's a reason that we don't do that method anymore. Maybe it's expired. The message will never expire. The message that Jesus saves and and anyone can come to the table is just as powerful and true as it is today as it was yesterday or 20 years ago. The message never changes, but maybe the method needs to change in our ability as a church to reach our neighborhood for Jesus Christ. And so maybe we need to forget the former things and say, Lord, what do you want to do new in my life and in my family? in my church. You know that statistically, the church is declining in America. That's sad. Statistically, in the U.S., the church is declining, not increasing. Guys, that's, we can't allow that to happen. So Lord, would you help us to do something new to reach people that we haven't reached, maybe doing things that we haven't done so that they will hear the message that saves Maybe God is calling us to some new things. And so my prayer is this, Lord, help us to let go of our former graces and Lord, show us the new ways, the new things that you wanna do in our lives and in our church. Lead us, Lord, in that. My question to you is what things do you have a hard time not letting go of that are holding you back from God's next step? What things in your life do you have trouble letting go of that are keeping you from what next steps you have in your life? Here's our second prayer. Our first prayer is, Lord, help me to let go of former graces. Our second prayer in this, help me to lean into smaller spaces. Now, this one's hard. This one's hard because some of us like a little bit of extra attention. Some of us uh, like a bigger platform, a larger audience, and, and we really have a tendency to think that growth means more instead of growth being maturity. In other words, quantity versus quality. We think that, that leaning into bigger spaces and leaning into louder and bigger means that that's where growth is. But maybe the Lord is calling us into smaller spaces. Maybe that's where truth, true maturity and growth is, is in the smaller spaces. You know, with this prayer, there's not a lot of glory. Lord, help me to lean into smaller spaces. There's not a lot of glory in that prayer, is there? There's not a lot of fanfare. Because it's not about getting bigger. It's about saying, Lord, where are you calling me? See, the reality is we are surrounded by small spaces in our lives. Where you work, where you serve, where you lead, where you you learn, where you live, all these things. We are surrounded by small spaces that God is calling us to illuminate those small corners in our lives. But sometimes we're kind of waiting for big moments. Oh, you know, I have this dream of this really big moment. And there's no problem with big dreams and big moments. But in the meantime, we're sitting around on our hands waiting for those big moments when God's like, I got a small space that I need you to be at. And we're like, no, God, sorry. I'm waiting for the big moment. <laughs> Lord, help me to lean in to smaller spaces. Now, just so that we know we're not off base, Jesus modeled this kind of ministry throughout his ministry on earth. Yes, he talked to large crowds and did amazing things like the feeding of the 5,000. But we see the most impactful ministries with individuals in small spaces with few people around. Think about it, just briefly, the woman at the well, the blind beggar outside of the wall, the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda, the last supper in the upper room with the disciples, the conversation and salvation of the thief at the cross next to him. How about when Thomas showed up there in that room And Jesus said, hey, look at my hands, my side. And he believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. In a world that seeks more likes, more subscribers, and more followers, may our prayer actually be, Lord, help me to lean into smaller spaces. Sorry, we didn't need that anyway, right? Thanks, Robert. I'm not going to promise it's not going to fall over again. You could stand there the whole time if you want, but. 
Thank you. See, Robert knows how to lean into the smaller spaces. You know what I mean? Like, that's great. That was not planned. I don't know. I just tried to bring those two together. May our prayer be, Lord, help me lean into the smaller spaces because uh, and God, help me not to think that I'm saving all my strengths for the big moments. Lord, help me not to think that you're preparing me for something large and something big and because I might miss the small areas that you're calling me to. Nothing wrong with something big and something, some big awesome thing. God may call us to that and give us dreams and visions of that, but he will use the small spaces to prepare us for those moments. And he's not gonna skip over those. And so our prayer needs to be, Lord, help me to give my best in the smaller spaces and not save my energy for that big opportunity or those big moments in life. But Lord, may I give everything I have when you're calling me to those small spaces. You know, those small spaces are people at work that everyone doesn't really want to talk to. But God calls you to say, hey, you know what? I think you should talk to them. But Lord, it's such a small space. That's where I'm calling you to. But it goes beyond ministry. I think that this applies to ministry for us individually and as a church, but also it implies in a lot of areas of, other, of life, doesn't it? Think about family relationships, think about marriage, think about finances. Uh, in a family relationship, small acts of kindness can go a long way among siblings. It can actually build, build that relationship, can it? In a marriage, we all know that small moments, small little cards, uh, flowers, small little times together, a cup of coffee, prayers together, these small moments are really what build a relationship. It's not the one big anniversary that we're saving all of our money. We're just going to, I mean, if you don't do any small stuff, she ain't going with you to the big one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> How about our finances? God is calling us to tithe. Lord, I'm just waiting for that raise. Or I'm waiting for the mega million to hit my numbers. Woo! And I'm going to give all half of it to the church. I'm going to give half of it to you. I'm going to donate half of it to this organization or to these missionaries or, or to this. But maybe God is asking you to be faithful with a little bit and start there consistently in small spaces. Maybe it's not the amount that really matters, but your commitment and your obedience that matters. It's true in our faith journey because it's not about the big moments at church or that one song that I've been longing for and they finally played it and I was in the moment. Or that big conference. I just can't wait for that big conference to come around because that conference, that big moment, that's where I'm gonna find God. I'm not too sure about that. Yes, you will find God in those big moments and you will find him in these great songs that we connect to and, and times here at church. But let me just tell you, your faith will grow in the daily small moments with Jesus in prayer and in his word. Lord, help me lean in to the smaller spaces. Think about the new that God wants to do. Think about the new that God wants to do in your life, in your family, in your marriage. Think about the new that he wants to do in our church. I'm actually praying, Lord, show us how you want us to move in a new way. May we forget about the things that, how we used to do it, but Lord, show us how we can reach people because there are people that don't know you as Lord and Savior and they're within earshot right now of this very place and where you live and where you work and where you learn. And maybe God is calling us into small spaces and helping us to say, Lord, show us how we can make a difference in new ways. And Lord, grow me into a new space with you. God wants to do a new thing in you. He is always at work. Our God starts it in you, and the word says he finishes it in you. That means that there is work to be done in the meantime. Amen. And he's always doing something new in your life. So may this be our prayer. In fact, in the bulletin, if you didn't grab one, they're up here at the, uh, the Pray First um, bracelet uh, table. In, in fact, tenemos también pulseras en español. We also have bracelets in Spanish. But there is a card that has the prayers that we're praying in this Pray First month. Help me to let go of former graces. Help me to lean into smaller spaces. And next 
Next week, or maybe the next two weeks, we'll be looking at these other prayers. Help me to show love in harder places and help me to bring life to hurting faces. We're going to explore those prayers in the weeks to come. But let's finish this morning with a time of prayer. Let's finish this morning with you talking to the Lord about what it is that's, that's, that he's put on your heart right now. Something that you've connected with in this message and teaching, maybe something that happened earlier in the service that God has on your heart, maybe something that happened earlier this week and you haven't gotten to the time and you haven't made the time to say, okay, Lord, let's have a conversation about that. I want you to spend some time now with the Lord. And then I'll close this in a word of prayer. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes and spend some time with the Lord? We're not comfortable with silence, but it'll be silent here for just a moment. The Lord is listening. Go ahead. Lord, we come humbly to you. And we recognize that you're listening to every single prayer right now at the same time. And that's just awesome because that's an amazing God. That's the amazing God you are. Lord, we desire for you to continue a new thing in our lives, in our faith, in our homes, in our church. So Lord, would you help us to put you first? Would you help us to let go of the way things used to be? And Lord, lean us into smaller spaces that you're calling us to make a difference. Or maybe recognize that nothing is too small that you're calling us to. Lord, everything matters. Father, I'm so thankful for this morning that you are bringing this to our attention, that you're, you're calling us to do things that your spirit's gonna lead us to do. We're gonna do that individually and as families and then as a church. Lord, we surrender to you and we ask that you lead us and guide us. We thank you for that. I'm gonna pause my prayer here just a moment with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And there may be some of you here that don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You recognize that God loves you this morning. You know that he has a plan for you. You can sense that. You can see that. You, you hear that. And you hear the Lord calling you and saying, I want you to call on me as Lord and Savior this morning. And if you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to believe in him, that he died on the cross for you and that he rose again and that he forgives you of your sins, then today you can call on the name of the Lord and you will receive his salvation. And when you do that, you become a child of God and we welcome you into the family and we want to be able to pray with you if that's where you're at right now. And so this isn't to embarrass you. This is just to know how, who we're praying for. But is there somebody here this morning that says, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ and I pray and ask him into my life. If that's you, just put your hand up and I'll see it and I'm gonna pray for you this morning. Anybody here? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Amen. We're going to pray with this individual, individuals who have raised their hand to accept Jesus Christ into their life. And here's how we like to do that. We're just going to, I'm going to say a prayer from here and repeat that, but we're, you're not going to do it alone. The whole Pursuit Church family is going to be praying with you. And so let's join in prayer. Just repeat this. This is from your heart to the Lord who's listening to you right now. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your love. I know you have a plan for me. And I admit that I'm a sinner. Forgive me today. I want to follow after you. I want to receive your love in my life. Thank you for making me a part of your family. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Could you give the Lord a praise offering for what he's doing? Amen. Woo. If you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you need to tell somebody a part of our confession of our faith, and it silences the enemy, and it gives voice to that testimony. So somebody you came with, 
tell somebody, hey, I gave my life to Jesus today, and we're going to celebrate that with you. Um, if you don't have a Bible and you uh, want to get one, we have some up here. Just come see me, and we'll get you a Bible to continue your journey of faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. 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 You are sent. We'll see you. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.